So today I'm going to talk about neural hierarchical models in ecology. Feel free to tweet this talk if you want. My Twitter handle is at MXWLJ. Let's start with the thought experiment. Suppose we mapped every tree. In 2020, this isn't really that outrageous, right? We have sub-meter high-resolution satellite imagery everywhere, high-density LIDAR data in many places, and enough mapped tree stems and canopies that we could probably put together a pretty decent data set to train a deep learning classifier that would come up with predictions for the location of every tree on Earth. If we map every tree, what would we have learned about plant ecology? We'd learn a lot about the distribution of plants, but even with that information, we not, might not be able to make inference about plant population dynamics. And the point here is that the data revolution and deep learning on their own are not sufficient for scientific inference. In statistical ecology, we usually use science-based hierarchical models for inference. In these models, some component describes how the data arise, some component relates to states that might be time or space evolving, and some component relates to the parameters that we don't know. Occupancy models are a fairly simple example of a hierarchical model. Here, the states are occupied or not, the data are detection, non-detection data, that are imperfect. So for example, we might have false absences in this data set, where a site is occupied, but we fail to detect that species. The parameters are P, the probability of detection, and Psi, the probability that a site is actually occupied. In these models, parameters can depend on covariates. So we might have some function F that maps altitude, temperature, greenness, etc., to the probability of occupancy. And often we assume linear relationships, maybe on some transform scale. So for an occupancy probability, we might use an inverse logit transform and take a linear combination of our inputs x, where beta is a parameter vector. But we can also accommodate nonlinearity. And there are some really good examples in the literature and that we've seen this past week of people using polynomials, spline basis expansions, and other methods to approximate nonlinear mappings from inputs to parameters in science-based hierarchical models. But what about neural networks? Neural networks are just function approximators. They map some set of inputs, x, to a hidden layer or hidden layers, and then predict data, y hat, as output. So this might be something like, will I see an American robin tomorrow? Or how many American robins can I expect to see tomorrow? But in ecology, simply predicting data is not sufficient for inference, and it's less satisfying than predicting states or ecological dynamics or parameters we actually care about. And so if we're not satisfied with simply predicting data, what could we do? Neural hierarchical models use neural networks to predict parameters. So all I've done here is I've replaced our predicted data y hat with a predicted probability of occupancy psi. In these models, the hierarchical model includes a neural network. Put differently, the neural network is embedded within a hierarchical model. And we can estimate the parameters of our hierarchical model and this neural network simultaneously. For the models that I'll discuss today, parameter estimation proceeds by minimizing a loss function that can be written in this form. It's an average over n examples, and we're averaging some differentiable log probability. The nice thing about writing a loss function like this is it permits stochastic mini-batch optimization. So that means we only have to load subsets of the data at a time. We never have to load the entire data set into memory, and this allows us to scale to large data sets. As a first example, I'll describe a neural joint species dynamic occupancy model using data from the North American Breeding Bird Survey. This includes 647 species over 21 years, and in total, it's around 38 million observations. In general, dynamic occupancy models are hidden Markov models that track the time evolution of occupancy states. The processes we care about are extinction, going from occupied to not occupied, and colonization, going from not occupied to occupied. The data, again, are imperfect and subject to false absences. For this particular neural joint species dynamic occupancy model, I want to highlight two components. One is a species encoder that maps species to species-specific weights that correspond to parameters of interest in our model. And this extends the idea of deep multi-species embedding, first described by Chen et al. in 2016, to share information among related species, the species in the same genus, family, and order. 
Another component is a space-time encoder, which combines regional, local, and potentially time-varying information to generate spatiotemporally referenced latent factors. And the combination of these latent factors with species-specific weights can give us our parameter estimates. If we zoom in on how these parameters are actually computed, we'll see some familiar faces. There's a dot product here that looks a lot like dot products in other JSDNs. So here, for our detection model, for example, we're taking a dot product between some spatiotemporal factors, these are latent, and some species-specific loadings, also latent. Worth pointing out here that we can include linear combinations of covariates, just like we would typically do in a GLM. Predictive performance on a withheld test set was pretty good, particularly in the eastern U.S. where we have a high density of data. It was not so great in the northernmost breeding bird survey routes in Alaska, where we don't have as much spatial information to borrow. This method assumes not, doesn't make any linearity assumptions for associations among species. So these are occupancy probabilities for morning dove and barn swallow. Each line is a breeding bird survey route, and it's a time series. Each color is a different ecoregion. So the relationships among species can vary by region, can vary through time, and can vary as a function of inputs to the model. Because we're estimating parameters we actually care about, we can do, we can make inference about range boundaries. So one theoretical expectation that we have is that range boundaries exist because of gradients and colonization and extinction. For most species, the data seems to be consistent with this theoretical expectation. The colonization is low at the range boundary and extinction is high. And the nice thing here is we're estimating these dynamics while accounting for imperfect detection. As a second example, I'll outline a convolutional animal movement model. And this is more like a proof of concept. It's a simulated example. On the left, I'm showing a canopy height model where yellow is the top of a tree and dark blue is the ground, and a simulated movement trajectory for some critter that likes to forage in trees. This critter has two behavioral states in transit, shown in black, and foraging, shown in red. Suppose we don't have access to the canopy height model and we don't observe any states directly. What could we do if we only had aerial imagery and the observed movement trajectories of individuals. Could we use spatial context to inform parameters in a, hid a hidden Markov model of animal movement? Of course we could. If we parameterize a hidden Markov model using a convolutional neural network that maps a raster valued input, essentially just these image chips, to state transition probability matrices, then we can do this, right? And, and this state model tracks the time evolution of behavioral states and the observations relate to the movement trajectory. No surprises here that this model does better with more data. Please don't try to fit it with 16 or 32 data points. These are the predictions for a withheld test set. Correctly, the model predicts the highest probability of transitioning to in transit over bare ground and the highest probabilities of transitioning to a foraging state over large trees. And one thing that I think is interesting here is at no point have we actually labeled any of these image chips as containing trees or not. In fact, the movement trajectories themselves, the combination of step sizes, turning angles, locations, and times, act as implicit labels for this model. And one thing that I want to reiterate is that neural hierarchical models augment, they don't replace existing models. So if there's some component of a model that you know, F in this case, you can retain that and approximate some unknown component of your model using a neural network. I think we're at a really interesting time right now in statistical ecology and deep learning. Just this past week, we've seen some really good examples of people using deep learning in new uh, and interesting ways. And Maybe it goes without saying that deep learning probably has some useful function approximators that we can borrow in statistical ecology that work well with tabular data, images, time series, and even networks. And now is a good time for us to think about these hybrid approaches as we're faced with an increasing volume and variety of data sets that we want to blend together in order to learn about ecological systems. This is also part of a broader trend towards science-based deep learning. So universal differential equations provide one example. The key idea here is that you parameterize a differential equation using a neural network. And in this framework, just as with neural hierarchical models, you can retain the dynamics that you know and approximate the dynamics that you don't know.
Another interesting example is provided by physics guided neural networks. The thing that I think is interesting here is the loss function consists of three terms. The first is an error term that measures the discrepancy between observed data and model predictions. The second is the penalty for model complexity. And the third is a penalty for physical inconsistency. How far have you deviated from the constraints or predictions of a science-based model? For instance, how far off was the model from mass balance in its predictions? And the nice thing about using a loss function like this is you can train a model that both fits the data well, is parsimonious, and is consistent with known physics. If you want to kick the tires on these models, I've put together a few interactive examples. If you go to github.com slash mbjoseph slash neuroecology, look for this launch binder icon, click on it, and it'll launch an interactive Jupyter Notebook session in your web browser where you can actually see what this looks like in terms of the implementations. Thanks, and with that, I'll take any questions.